Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Logan, and today I wanted to make a really quick video covering the process of installing a custom OS on some kind of NAS hardware. And you could consider this video to be sort of a follow-up to the Ugreen NAS Sync review that we made a little over a week ago, but this process applies to many other NASs as well. Since releasing our review of the NAS, it seems like Ugreen has been changing their stance on whether or not they want to allow customers to install a custom OS on these units. And eventually the response that we got from Ugreen made it sound like they would continue to support their hardware under warranty in the case of failure or manufacturer defect, but of course they weren't interested in providing support for any third-party software since they really want people to use UGOS and that's a reasonable perspective for them to have. But this has been causing a little bit of confusion lately since for the most part it seems like you have to take apart the NAS and thus break a hardware warranty sticker in order to gain access to the internal operating system SSD and replace it with your own. Well, the point that I want to demonstrate in this video is that you don't actually have to do that in order to get the NAS to boot to another drive and install a different OS. In fact, you don't even need a screwdriver and you can retain the original OS in case you ever want to revert your changes. This only takes about five minutes and a lot of the steps that I'll be showing here can actually be applied to pretty much any NAS that has an HDMI port, like this TerraMaster unit that we've also reviewed on our channel. In order to get the Ugreen NAS to boot from a different drive, we quickly need to understand how exactly these NAS systems boot, and as it turns out, these things are very similar to run-of-the-mill mini PCs that you can buy off places like Amazon, in the sense that they all have regular Intel processors and, most importantly, have a standard UEFI firmware. The UEFI firmware is the first program that any modern computer loads after you hit the power button, and its main job is to do things like run a power on self-test, initialize expansion devices, detect all of your storage devices, and boot the system into an OS. And with most systems, you can just hit a certain key on boot in order to access the setup for this UEFI firmware and choose an alternate device to boot from. But since Ugreen is selling this as an all-in-one solution, and they're not too crazy about people running their own OSs, it seems that they disabled this feature, and the only thing the UEFI firmware ever tries to do is boot from the internal SSD, which loads UGOS. But as it turns out, if you can trick this firmware into thinking the SSD doesn't have an OS installed, it won't be able to boot, and thus it'll throw you into the regular setup interface, or boot from any other device that it detects as bootable. And this is what I briefly covered in our review of the DXP4800+. Plus. If you set up UGOS like normal, you'll be able to go into the control panel and enable access via SSH. And what this allows you to do is gain access to the NAS via a terminal and modify the underlying Linux OS that UGOS runs on, which in this case is Debian. Chances are your computer already has the software built in to use this feature with the NAS, so just open a terminal or a command prompt and try typing in ssh space and then your username on the NAS, followed by an at symbol, and finally the IP address of the NAS, which you can see in the URL bar as you're using the web interface. From here, you should be able to use your regular password for UGOS to log in. From SSH, we can do a lot of really useful things, and ironically, what we want to do here is actually break UGOS in a controlled manner to prevent the UEFI firmware from detecting it and booting into it. For this process, I'm assuming you don't have any other NVMe drives in the system, only the internal NVMe drive or EMMC flash, depending on your model. I haven't tried doing this on the EMMC variant of the Ugreen NAS since we don't have one on hand, but these commands should be very similar for both models. Now what we're going to do is ask Linux to give us a list of all of the drives in the system. And to do that, in the SSH window, type lsblk and press enter. You'll get a list, and all of these should correspond to the drives you have installed. As you can see, I have one NVMe device, marked as NVMe 0 and 1, with a few partitions on it, and the one that we're interested in is the EFI partition, NVMe 0N1P1. If you have an EMMC model, this is probably going to be called MMC BLK 0P1. And these aren't actual folders that you can go into, but they're sort of like pointers to the physical devices and partitions in our system. So in order to make these changes to the EFI files, we need to mount the EFI partition to our file system. For this, I ran the command sudo space su, which then asked for my password and gave me elevated permissions on the NAS, followed by the command mkdir space forward slash mnt forward slash nvme underscore efi, 
which then makes our mount point in the file system, followed by the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash nvme 0 n one p one space forward slash mnt forward slash nvme underscore efi. And with that, we have access to the files of the EFI partition. And to see them, type in cd space forward slash mnt forward slash nvme underscore efi and press enter. And then type ls and press enter. You can see here I have two folders, one called boot, all in lowercase, and the other called efi, all in caps. And that efi folder is the one we're going to change. By running the command mv space efi space efi underscore rename, all capitals, the system will rename that EFI folder, meaning the UEFI firmware won't be able to find the boot files on the SSD, and as far as it's concerned, there's no way it can boot into UGOS because it doesn't know it's there anymore. You can run the ls command again to make sure this worked, and you can see the renamed folder, and at this point you can just run the reboot command. And if you have an HDMI display connected, the NAS should kick you back out into a regular UEFI setup screen. And from here, as I covered in our review, the last thing you need to do is use a keyboard to move over to the Advanced tab, scroll down to the Watchdog settings and enter that section, and change the Watchdog control setting from Enabled to Disabled. This will disable the built-in mechanism that automatically reboots the NAS after 3 minutes if the original OS isn't loaded. At this point, I'm going to plug in a USB, this one has Fedora Linux on it, which I actually use every day on my personal desktop, and I just made this USB in a few minutes by going to Fedora's website, downloading the 64-bit ISO file that I wanted, and using a free tool for Windows called Rufus, I flash the contents of that ISO to my USB. So back in the BIOS, I can head on over to save my changes and reboot. And with that, the NAS will automatically find the USB media and boot into Fedora perfectly fine. It even has a desktop and the drivers for the 10 gigabit NIC so we can use this as an overkill mini PC and watch some YouTube or do some light gaming if we really want to. And I'm not sure why you would do this, but if you really feel the need to, you can also install regular Windows 10. Uh, here's the installer for Windows 10 LTSC 2021 and it even detects the built-in NVMe boot drive and all the SATA hard drives. And if you want, with either of these operating systems, you have the option of completely wiping the built-in SSD and replacing it with your software of choice. But if you do that, I'm not exactly sure how you can get UGOS back on unless Ugreen would provide you with a hard drive image or something. Since all we did is change the EFI partition of the drive to disable it, we can theoretically map that partition again and fix it, so this whole process is completely reversible, and I think it might be smarter to keep it that way. The best solution, in my opinion, is to just grab another cheap 128GB NVMe drive and slot it into one of the user-accessible NVMe ports on the bottom. Then just install your OS of choice onto that SSD, and you'll always have the internal SSD ready to go if you want to restore it to the factory OS. And I should note that since making this review, I've been using a standard Linux distro booting from USB for about a week straight on this NAS with absolutely no problems, no random reboots or anything like that, but we still have a lot to test with these units and we'll keep you posted if we find anything interesting. And since I mentioned it at the beginning of this video, I wanted to take this TerraMaster unit as well and quickly go over how you can do the same thing. We have the TerraMaster F4223, which is another Intel-based NAS that we covered in a previous review. And the nice thing about this is that you can open it up without breaking any warranty stickers. The thing I wanted to show you though is that TerraMaster actually chose to build a tiny little USB stick into these NASs, which is where their bootloader for their operating system lives. Now, this is probably done as a cost-saving measure, but it means it's quite trivial to unplug that USB and store it away for later, and your NAS will boot from any other device that you plug in. I decided to populate this M.2 slot here with another 128GB drive, and just like that, it's also ready to go and should boot from any properly formatted USB install stick. So, I think that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Let us know if you have any questions or comments down in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any of our future content. And as always, have an awesome day.